understanding why we are the way we are, how do we, how do we become the, the individuals that we are, um, that's really what motivates me every day to you know, wake up and get out of bed and run to the lab. The Pickhower Institute uh, was always envisioned to be something special, to bring together people that had a common vision in what neuroscience could be and would be, and that is an effort to understand the mechanisms of cognition, of learning and memory at many different levels. Of all the sciences, neuroscience is the one science that tells us fundamentally about ourselves, who we are, why we are the way we are. So in a, in a sense, it's the science of what it is to be human. Being able to figure out how the nervous system works at a molecular and cellular level is key to solving some of the major problems of our generation, depression, suicide, schizophrenia, neurodevelopmental disorders, autism. Neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders affect a huge fraction of the population. And it's enough to have one person in a family that has one of these problems to impact the entire family. And I don't think that there's a single one of us that doesn't know a family like this that is affected. It's very exciting to now see some of our work, basic neuroscience, basic neurobiology, come into fruition in terms of understanding fundamental mechanisms of brain disorders. Compared to many other fields, um, for instance, cancer, um, I think a lot of the big mechanisms have already been worked out. And I think the whole field at this stage is more at um, a position to try to figure out the solution to combat the disease. Um, but neuroscience is still, someone call it the last frontier um, for life science research. Picar Institute is a great place to study Alzheimer's disease because many scientists are studying the fundamentals of the mechanism behind learning and behind memory formation. So once we understand these important mechanisms, then uh, we have very good clues in terms of how to develop new strategies to come up with therapeutic interventions. My name is Mark Baer and I study how experience modifies the brain. We became interested in a protein that was missing in a rare cause of autism called Fragile X Syndrome. And we made some unexpected discoveries um, that actually pointed the way to a potential therapeutic strategy for the disease, and which we then tested that uh, idea and successfully. And uh, this has now inspired uh, clinical trials in Fragile X and now more broadly in autism. We have two drugs in human clinical trials. One has recently completed a phase two trial and will go into phase three. And I think the results look extremely promising. This is a very exciting time to be a neuroscientist because now we're reaching a point where we understand enough about the brain to begin to piece things together into, into the, in, and address some of the really big picture, deep questions of brain function. My name is Earl Miller. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I study the neural mechanisms of high-level thought and action. I'm trying to understand the neural basis of goal-directed behavior, how we can identify what goals we want to achieve and how we can come up with plans to make those goals come about. I'm Matt Wilson, and I study the mechanisms of learning and memory and uh, what goes on during sleep. When I had originally designed these experiments to study animals exploring in mazes, I would record the activity. The animals would run for uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, and then I would take them out of the apparatus and uh, bring them back to, uh, you know, to relax in a little holding platform. At some point, I noticed that the activity in the brain sounded very much like the animal was up and running around again. Upon analyzing that data, I discovered that indeed, the activity that the animal had engaged in while it was running on the maze was being replayed during these sleep states. In some sense, the animal had the capacity to dream. 
What I love about science is that you can find as close to an absolute truth as is possible. And that's extremely beautiful and motivating to me. My name is Miriam Heyman, and I'm very interested in why neurons are vulnerable in neurodegenerative disease. Just that ability to understand, to better understand the natural world, um, and to do this with your own hands is very satisfying. You know, I interviewed in other universities too, and at one of the places that I interviewed, you know, a friend of mine who was there afterwards said to me, I think that maybe you should scale down your vision of the things that you want to do. Um, that maybe people will think you're being overambitious or unrealistic. I gave the same talk here that I gave there. And afterwards, um, Susumu, who was director there, said to me, I liked it that you had such a big vision. <laughs> and I think that when Susumu said that, then I realized that this was the right place for me. My name is Kay Tai, and I'm the newest Pick Hour PI here, and it is absolutely a dream come true to be here and be a part of this amazing family. I think neuroscience is, in my opinion, the hottest field you know around right now, and I think it's it's incredibly important, and um, it's actually quite remarkable how little we know about our own brains. I think we're still just scratching the surface of what the brain is capable of and how these molecular machines assemble within neurons to allow these very complex behavioral phenomena that define us as humans work. My name is Troy Littleton and I study how neuronal synapses work and form in the brain. I think the tool set that we have now allows us really to think about solving some problems that we couldn't before. You're using your machine to try to understand your machine, which Philosophically, it's, uh, there's a kind of a logical loop there. Will you ever understand yourself by looking at yourself? You know, I remind people in my lab that what we're doing our experiments. You know, we don't really know what the outcome is. And then sometimes we expect a certain outcome, but it doesn't always come out the way that we expect. And um, that's the fun part. We are really very uniquely positioned because here we not only interact with colleagues in neuroscience, but people um, in different disciplines, such as people in physics, in engineering, in chemistry, in genomics. I mean, they are all nearby and it's really a perfect position for us to collaborate with all of these people to leverage their strengths to probe this very difficult question. My fascination with the brain began with the news of John Kennedy's assassination. I was a little boy at the time, about six years old, uh, but I still vividly remember the, the incident. There was a lot of discussion about what might be damaged, what functions might be missing um, if, if uh, the brain was damaged. And I just remember being amazed that uh, so much could go on uh, in the brain, and that really triggered my lifelong interest in it. The first things that interested me in neuroscience was um, actually a personal experience through um, seeing my brother who has schizophrenia um, take medications that are given to schizophrenics. Uh, so there are many drugs that are used today, um, and the way that they function is not known. Um, we know which uh, receptors these drugs bind to, but actually their mechanism of action is not fully understood. And this is the reason why many of these drugs given to people who have schizophrenia or depression uh, or anxiety, we, we don't actually understand exactly how they work. But if we did, perhaps better therapeutics could be developed. So this is you know, a very broad question that many people are interested in. And I felt that um, you know, from my basic cell biological training, um, you know, I, could, I could perhaps contribute to this in some way. Without memory, uh, you, let's say you suffer Alzheimer's. And in the early phase of Alzheimer, where the patient still have a little bit of memory, but they, they are, the memory is declining, uh, patient will sometimes say to the fa fa family members, 
Hey, could you, would you, would you please remind me who I am? That uh, apparently very common questions, which indicate they're losing the self-identity. They, they lost. In my own field of fruit fly genetics, Drosophila, the ability to do genetic tricks to manipulate how neurons work is very exciting because we're really at the cutting edge of having all the genes known now once the genome project has been completed. And so using a fruit fly as a model system to find genes that can cause epilepsy and ultimately figuring out how we can cure our fly models will potentially give us insights into both new targets for drugs as well as new mechanisms for epilepsy within humans. PCAR Institute has this coherent continuum levels of research trying to understand questions related to learning and memory at multiple level. And I'm the bridge between the genes um, with the uh, brain circuitry. So I'm right in the middle to bring these two gaps together. We think we have discovered what may be a neural correlate of consciousness. We're doing experiments right now doing that. We think it's a neural basis of consciousness because it solves a major mystery of consciousness. It explains how we can hold two thoughts in mind simultaneously and not have them jumble up and smoosh together in some weird way. After the Human Genome Project, uh, there's a shift in um, understanding the biology to really look at the regulation of the genes. We found that in Alzheimer's disease, the book is completely closed and the genes cannot be expressed and this causes cognitive impairment and dementia. And we're very excited that um, we found a novel way to allow the book to be open again for the genes important for learning and memory to be expressed again. And we actually have a very good way to reverse the symptom of cognitive impairment. We think that this is um, a, a new way to look at Alzheimer's disease. You know, in the past, whenever someone would ask a question, so when is, you know, when are you gonna find a cure for X? When are you gonna find a major discovery? And uh, the joke was it was always five to 10 years away. You say five to 10 years because you feel that's a, it's beyond the foreseeable future. It's just out there. But I think now five to 10 years, it's not in the distant, unforeseeable future. It is in the realizable future. It is on the horizon. When we look back on this moment, 50 years hence, we'll realize that this was the moment where a lot of the painstaking work to understand basic functions of the nervous system were finally being translated into novel therapeutics for the diseases of the nervous system, both psychiatric and neurological. I want to tell you, Pikawa Institute is one of the best learning and memory oriented uh, brain research institutes in the whole world. That, that's the way I look at it. In fact, I hear from the very respectable neuroscientists, we are imitating Pikawa Institute. It, it, it's a fantastic place. <laughs>